What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to episode number 325 of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tony Mango, and this is the Hot Tags edition of the week, where I'll be breaking down some of the current events, gossip, rumors, news, and pretty much anything else that went down in the world of professional wrestling and sports entertainment over the past couple of days. First things first, how y'all doing today? Hopefully you have a little bit of fun listening to this. Make sure you drop your comments below and tell me what you think about any of the topics that we're talking about. If you have something on your mind, and uh, thanks for tuning in. So let's uh, just get right into things right now with the furthest back storyline from the past bunch of days. Rich Swan has been officially released from WWE. They classified this as mutually parting ways, which is pretty interesting. Uh, this is a story that we've talked about here and there, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but if you are unfamiliar with how this has all been going down, he was suspended in December based off of an arrest where it was supposed to be some kind of a situation of like domestic abuse, and then eventually it got to a point where Triple H had specifically said if he is found to be guilty of this kind of stuff, we will, uh, we will be releasing him immediately. Turns out that he wasn't actually found guilty of that. He actually was just cleared of the charges, yet WWE released him anyway. And this is a little bit weird because this is a situation where I can kind of understand both sides of an argument. On the side of WWE did the right thing, you can look at this and go, well, he was not convicted of this. He was found not guilty, and that means that more than likely, he is not guilty. Um, at the very least, it gives them an out to say that uh, that he, you know, wasn't found guilty or whatever like that. Um, if you look at it through that kind of a way, uh, and you say WWE did the right thing, the right thing would be, yeah, but you know what? you still don't want to have any kind of negative connotation going forward. And if you have to protect the company more than you protect the individual, then it's better to not risk anything to let him go. And eventually in the future, bring him back. If you look at it on the negative side of things, why would WWE release him for being found not guilty? It's not that they would have kept him if he was found guilty. That's obviously not the case. It's not like some kind of weird rule where you had to pick one or the other or something like that. But I don't know. I mean, um, I can see it from both sides. I think unless there's something more to this, I think I would be more in the camp of not releasing him and just kind of waiting until after WrestleMania to bring him back more than anything, because we have the tournament going on right now. They didn't have plans for him to be in the tournament based off of the way that they've been booking it and everything like that. And he's not the type of guy that is needed. I mean, it's not like you get rid of uh, Swan and 205 Live craps out or something like that. So I would have been more along the lines of saying, like, look, all right, we need a little bit of time. Distance ourselves from this. Distance yourself from this. And in a month or two or whatever like that, come back and, you know, we'll kind of pick up where we left off. But maybe WWE doesn't value him enough to see him as being worth that little bit of a trouble and just kind of paying him for sitting at home, too. Because we do have Noam Dar is injured, Neville is just sitting out his contract, and Brian Kendrick is injured, and they're trying to bring more people into the fold. So maybe they just kind of looked at him as going like, look, we don't need Rich Swan." And if he does have any kind of connotation that is associated with us, it would be a negative one more than a positive one. It's not worth the headache. Let's just get rid of him. That sucked for Rich Swan, but it looks like he's already bouncing back. He already has some announcements for some uh, shows that he's doing, some bookings and stuff. So I was never the biggest fan of Rich Swan in the grand scheme of things of being like, my God, this guy's going to be the best or something like that. But he seemed entertaining enough. And for being not guilty or at least being found not guilty, I think he's kind of gotten a little bit of a shitty end of the stick here. So I'm hoping that he comes back to WWE in the future, and if not, that he has a good enough career outside of it that he doesn't need to, you know? So we're going to piggyback off that and talk about another story that we've actually talked about before, which is about the pay-per-views. And it was a little bit of just speculation before. Now it is confirmed 
all the pay-per-views after WrestleMania will be co-branded, which means that Raw and SmackDown are going to both share the pay-per-views, just as they would for the Big Four pay-per-views. Now we're not necessarily going to have Big Four pay-per-views anymore. We're going to still have those pay-per-views, of course, but we're not going to have that same type of special feel to them. And they're going to add an extra hour to these pay-per-views. Uh, it's going to be four hours per pay-per-view plus an hour of the pre-show, which is a good and a bad thing. And there are positives and negatives for a lot of different things here. And if you saw my post on the Mega Maniacs, then you're aware of some of them. And if you don't uh, have a Facebook account and stuff like that, I'm trying to bring it up right now so I can uh, read them off to you. And, you know, maybe you missed it and it's kind of hard to, like, go down the list and figure out exactly where I would have typed it and stuff like that. But uh, my opinions haven't really changed too much about how they're doing this. So this is my the way that I kind of see it. A good thing is when you've got Raw and SmackDown on the same card, then you don't need to fill it with a bunch of filler. Pay-per-views are going to have the most important matches that they can possibly have in the company, the same as what they used to do before we had a brand split. That worked out really well. Positive also is going to be that when you have more pay-per-views per brand, you don't need to stretch out feuds as often. So when you had an instance of, say, Bray Wyatt versus Randy Orton, that was a thing that they were building it up for a couple of months and then you started building it up even higher with the Royal Rumble, and you went WrestleMania, then you went to another pay-per-view, and then you went to another pay-per-view, and whatever like that. And it it kind of, it, it gets frustrating after a while. We had, what, three pay-per-views in a row of Jinder Mahal and Randy Orton after that, and then it was like two or three of Shinsuke Nakamura against um, Jinder Mahal. And it ends up being really exhausting because there was all those episodes of Raw or SmackDown in between those pay-per-views, and it's essentially a month and a half between pay-per-views and stuff like that. It's very tiresome. Now we won't have to do that as much because they'll be able to move on to different feuds, and if you are worried about, like, well, we can't burn through all of our stuff because there's not an important amount of matches to put on there, well, you've got the other brand to help pick up the slack, so that's pretty good. Uh, another good thing is going to be that for Money in the Bank, we'll be able to get Raw and SmackDown people competing in the Money in the Bank match, so we don't have to do just SmackDown, which is really good, because I hated that, I thought that was so stupid, uh, I still think that that would be better off as a SummerSlam match, but, you know, yeah, it is what it is, uh, another thing too is, here's like the, the split when it comes to this, it's a good thing that if you don't have people on the pay-per-views and people are fans of those people, that they'll have to tune in to Raw and SmackDown to see them. The bad thing is if you don't have those people on those pay-per-views, they don't seem important. So somebody like, say, Brizongo. Brizongo aren't going to be able to get on pay-per-views the way that they had been getting on. They were on there because it was a SmackDown-only thing. And they had less that they had to work with. They were bigger fish in a smaller pond, essentially. That that phrase is probably going to be said a bunch of different times. So, Mojo Rawley versus Zack Ryder. That match happened on a pay-per-view because it needed to. They needed that match to be on the card. They needed to fill the card out. It's not going to happen when it comes to a Raw and a SmackDown pay-per-view because it's not important. Which goes to show you who are the important ones and who aren't. And when you are told by WWE that somebody is not important enough to be on these pay-per-views, you tend not to care about them as much. The downside when it comes to that even more, not just to the wrestler themselves, but to the shows, is that if you don't care about those people, and those are making up a lot of what the show's contents are going to be, then you don't care about the shows. For instance, take the Mojo Rawley Zack Ryder thing. Mojo Rawley and Zack Ryder is no WrestleMania main event. Under no circumstances is that going to be a WrestleMania main event. It's just not going to draw the same. You put that aside a little bit, though. You say, maybe there's people interested in it. When they go on a pay-per-view, it seems like the feud matters. If they exist solely on SmackDown, then you're going to go, hey, why do I give a shit about watching these two jabronis? They can't even get on a pay-per-view. So then you don't tune into SmackDown because you look at the lineup of what happens on SmackDown that night 
and it's Mojo Rawley wrestling, it's Zack Ryder wrestling, it's Ty Dillinger who never gets on a pay per view, it's it's uh, Sin Cara fighting Baron Corbin, and nobody gives a shit. That is very detrimental to Raw and to SmackDown. It'll make the shows feel less important, and it'll seem like the shows are nothing but filler leading up to the only thing that's important, which are the pay-per-views. Another downside is when you add that extra hour, that means an extra hour every single month for every single pay-per-view, and if the pay-per-view sucks, that is going to be tiresome. It's going to be boring. It's going to be too long to deal with. The big four don't feel that special anymore. That's another thing that's a negative. And another negative, too, that is going to happen for sure is when they realize that they can't fit everybody on the card and they end up having a bunch of six-man tags or fatal four-ways or just clusterfuck multi-man matches. Another thing to mention, though, and this is one of the main story parts that we're going to talk about for this, is that they actually got rid of some pay-per-views in the process. We no longer have Payback, Battleground, of course, we still didn't have, at the beginning of the year, they never announced No uh, no Mercy or Great Balls of Fire. And they also changed the Hell in a Cell date, and they changed when Extreme Rules was. So, I hate that. <laughs> uh, I hate that we still have Hell in a Cell, and that we still have TLC, but we got rid of Payback and Battleground, and No Mercy. I'm glad that we got, our great, uh, great, got rid of Great Balls of Fire. That one sucked. No Mercy is a good name. Why not keep No Mercy and get rid of TLC or Hell in a Cell? Why not keep Payback and Battleground? And, you know, like, that that's very strange. So I don't like it. Um, I would not be shocked at all if they added another pay-per-view at some point in this year when they started to realize that this wasn't necessarily working out as well as they wanted it to be, but I'm also not holding out hope that that's the case. I still think that Roadblock was a good title. They should have brought Road- Roadblock back too. And it's really just disappointing to see that they are, they're trying these things out and they might not necessarily be thinking about all the consequences or at the very least, if they are, that they're valuing certain things that I don't think that they should necessarily value. Like I, I hate the idea that Hell in a Cell is just going to happen in September it's just, it doesn't matter what feuds are going on, we will have a Hell in a Cell match. That sucks. Save the Hell in a Cell. Bring it out if you need it to. And TLC, I've argued this a million times, TLC is not a, a fucking match. It's a ladder match. Stop calling it a TLC match. That's like me saying that a Fatal 4-Way can turn into a... I don't know, uh, you, you make up some other kind of thing, and then you go, it's a fatal four-way where it's no, disqual- no disqualification. And then you go, yeah, okay, well, a fatal four-way is no disqualification. Yes, but also they can use kendo sticks. So it is a uh, quattro kendo match, and it's like a, you can use a kendo stick in a fucking fatal four-way. Oh, yeah, you can, but we just want to call it this. Well, what is a TLC match? It's a match where you can use tables, ladders, and chairs, and you typically climb a ladder to win, to grab whatever is at the top to win. What do you do in a ladder match? You can use any kind of weapons, because there's no disqualification, and climb a ladder and you retrieve something from the top and then you win. It's the exact same fucking thing. So I hate the TLCs there. The logo sucks too, so I hate the TLC logo. And it's really just disappointing because Payback, Battleground, that kind of stuff, it's a little bit bland, but at the very least, No Mercy is a good name, and Roadblock is a good name too, and they should have just kept those two, and god damn it. Uh, also, even though this is a good thing as far as less work for me to do in the sense of I don't have to cover pay-per-views as much with two of them being eradicated from the lineup for them, I guess technically, the downside to it is I don't get as much revenue. Because nothing compares to the pay-per-view coverage. Whether it's the YouTube channel or the actual uh, hits on the website, the pay-per-views are the things that draw in more people than anything else. So now I'm going to make less money this year. Awesome. Fantastic. It's also going to be harder for me to write articles for other outlets because I can't depend on writing up things about the pay-per-views happening. Now I'm going to have to write up more 
separate stories about things leading up to the pay-per-views, which means I'm going to repeat myself more often. It's very frustrating to deal with that kind of stuff. But it is what it is. I can't change their mind about it. If I could change their mind about stuff, I would have changed their mind about a million things by now. Uh, And speaking of the whole idea of events in the future, there is talk that they want to hold a some kind of an event at the Melbourne, which I, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly because I heard something the other day that it wasn't Melbourne, it's actually something else, and I couldn't remember what it was. So if you are Australian, how should I say that? Uh, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, which holds over 100,000 people, WWE wants to do something with that this year, and then I don't know what they're going to do necessarily. They got rid of Emma, and <laughs> it's not like Buddy Murphy's going to really draw all that crazily or something like that. So if they're looking for Australian homegrown talent, they don't have that many options here. But I don't think that they necessarily need to. That's just an extra little bonus, you know. You could have the uh, um, iconic duo. They're Australian, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they are. You could have them do something, you know, some kind of a tag team match. And you could have Buddy Murphy do something with the Cruiserweight title or something like that and draw some people when it comes to that kind of stuff. But uh, I don't think it's a, a priority, really. And I would be kind of interested to see if they were to do something that wasn't a pay-per-view. Just kind of try to sell it out as like a special episode of Raw or maybe try to do some kind of a special separate kind of network special like the the Beast and the East thing or something like that. Uh, that was essentially a pay-per-view, but I mean, not doing the whole like we're going to do, uh, I don't know, we're, we're going to do Battleground here. We're going to do Vengeance here, you know, something like that. Like they could do something different. We had Starcade that happened in a live event. Maybe you can do a live event there and try to build it as like a, a non pay per view pay per view sort of. Might be fun, kind of fun, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> a couple more topics to talk about here. This one's actually a funny one. It's not funny in the sense that it's like it's funny that it happened. It's funny in the sense that it's like what do you talk about without laughing about this a little bit? Um, it's it's also equally sad, which sometimes the best stories are the ones that are funny and sad at the same time. If you remember Jenna Maraska from both Survivor and from TNA, uh, she was uh, one in one of the worst matches ever with Charmel, and where they were just like slapping each other around, and it was just just garbage. But she recently was arrested, and they found her passed out in her car. Uh, they revived her with Narcan, which is used to treat people with like opiates and stuff like that. Uh, she started to regain consciousness and they noticed that in the process, she was trying to hide this Ziploc bag with syringes in it, in her purse. So naturally the cops, I mean, the cops came out anyway, of course, but in the process of treating her and she was being in in the ambulance and stuff and trying to fight everybody and stuff, she actually bit a cop. (laughs) So... (laughs) It's a sad thing to hear that somebody is a drug addict and that they are suffering from substance abuse and stuff like that. But at the same time, it is kind of funny that you start scrolling through your news feed and it says something like, you know, Chris Jericho talks to so-and-so on the Chris Jericho podcast and Stone Cold Steve Austin interviewed about who his favorite superstars are nowadays. And then it goes, Jenna Maraska bites a cop and you're just like, what? Okay, what the fuck happened there? Um, Hopefully she gets help. And that's all you can really say at that point. Um, That cop's got a story he can tell forever. He could be like, you know, this former Survivor contestant and former wrestler bit me sometime. Uh, Let's pivot from that, though, over to, well, you know what? Let's just uh, talk about something that really is another unfortunate thing. Let's just keep the bad news going, I guess. There was that whole shooting in Florida that happened, and now that has gotten WWE to convince themselves that Apollo Crews should not be Apollo Crews anymore, that he should just be Apollo, because apparently we are not smart enough to understand that there are multiple people with the same last name in this country, in this world, which is really just, I don't know, uh, now he's just Apollo, and that is lame, and it's the longest, uh, the latest in the long names of people who have either had a surname or a first name taken away from them. You remember Antonio Cesaro, or Alexander Rusev, or Biggie Langston, or Elias Samson? Latest one, Apollo. 
So that sucks. That's going to hurt him, I think, more than anything. That's not going to help him. It's not like people are going to look at him and go, oh, it's Apollo. Okay, well, now he sounds cooler. He's not going to sound any cooler. If anything, he's going to sound worse. And that also means that they don't have that Cruz can't lose catchphrase, which I, I like that enough. So they can't see that anymore. It can't be Apollo can't follow. Like, you can't do anything when it comes to that stuff. Maybe it's you can't follow Apollo if he's really good in the ring or something like that. There you go, WWE. I just did your fucking work for you. you know? But I don't like that idea. Uh, it'll take a while for me to get used to just calling him Apollo. And there's still times every once in a while where I just say Big E Langston or I say Elias Samson or, you know, I'm going to every once in a while think Conor O'Brien. And I'm sure I'll say Apollo Crews more than anything else. Rusev, I got used to now, him just being Rusev. Yeah, he wasn't Alexander Rusev all that long. But Apollo Crews, uh, that's so much better than Apollo. Jeff Jarrett is going to be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame class of 2018, which is something that was a rumor that was going around, and most people, myself included, were like, eh, I don't really think that that's got too much steam behind it. It's probably BS. Lo and behold, it's real, which is... Very strange. Uh, Jeff Jarrett seemed like one of those people that might not ever get into the Hall of Fame because of his ties to other companies and his issues over the years with a lot of different things, whether it be alcohol abuse or the fact that he and Karen and everybody else like that have that whole situation going on, him and Kurt Angle and whatnot. Uh, there's a lot of things working against him right now. We've talked a lot about Jeff Jarrett in the past, about like some different things that he's done in the past that aren't really all that great. The gold scam and uh, booking himself in a lot of different ways and stuff like that. But I'll be a little bit optimistic here. I remember an era where I really liked Jeff Jarrett. I grew up uh, primarily in the, the mid nineties era of wrestling, the new generation and the early attitude era. That was kind of like my, my current era type of thing where I was growing up. Cause I had watched wrestling before that. And I obviously watched wrestling afterwards since I've been doing this shit for 12 years now. Jesus, really? Yeah, 2006 or so is when I started kind of getting back into it. Um, so I grew up where, for instance, Jeff Jarrett didn't seem like a Ric Flair ripoff to me. He seemed like he was doing his own thing, like that strut was more of a Jeff Jarrett strut than a Ric Flair strut to me, because I was also a WWF guy, not a WCW guy. I don't watch WCW, of course, as much as I could, but if I had to pick between the two, I always picked WWF. So, to me, the figure four and the strut were Jeff Jarrett things. I did used to know all about Honky Tonk Man, though, and he did seem like he was just a ripoff of Honky Tonk Man a little bit, too, but that's neither here nor there. But he was pretty much like my go-to Intercontinental Champion, and he progressed in some different ways. That whole slap nuts thing was stupid. But the the short hair era, I still liked him doing, during that. He was still a pain in the ass heel and somebody that I still really liked watching more than often than not. So I don't have that much of a connection with him being somebody that I hate like a lot of other people do. I'm sure if I can get paid in on a future episode where we're talking about this, I'm sure he'll give a rundown of all the things that he hates about him and Wago as well, too. But from my perspective, I'm glad that Jeff Jarrett is going into the Hall of Fame. And there, there's people that I'm sure are more deserving of it, and they will go in as well. Um, but, yeah, I, I I remember fondly liking Jeff Jarrett back in the day. And at the very least, when it comes to his career in WWF, with the whole double J kind of thing. I'm glad to see a little bit of recognition when it comes to that. So I may be of the unpopular opinion here, but I'm going to give a thumbs up to Jeff Jarrett going into the hall of fame. We will talk more about hall of fame stuff. Of course, when we do our wrestling with the past a little bit later on towards WrestleMania, that's enough for now. Final thing to talk about for this episode's hot tags is the latest special on the WWE network, which was WWE photo shoot with Kurt Angle not the best one. Something that I would recommend checking out if you got a little bit of time, though. I would say see it more than skip it. Uh, he had a little bit of insight here and there for some positive things to say about Eddie Guerrero, about Big Show, Edge, uh, Vince McMahon, a lot of things about Vince McMahon. Um, a little bit of insight here and there for some stuff. Nothing really all that great that stood out to me uh, to be like, you know, this is one little part that really was special or something like that. But it was good enough. So... 
I like photo shoot enough that I hope that they can kind of kind of continue doing this in the future because it doesn't seem like it's really all that cost uh, costly of them to actually do this show. And I'd like to see a lot more people be involved. I'd like to see, say, a WWE photo shoot of something like, um, I don't know, Sergeant Slaughter or something like that, you know? Or, holy shit, I'd love to see a fucking photo shoot with Iron Sheik and see what kind of stories he pulls out of his ass and stuff. Hacksaw would be kind of fun. Some of the current people, too, that haven't been around as long as those legends, you know? Like, maybe a WWE photo shoot with, like, Tony Chimmel or something. Like, that'd be kind of cool. I don't think that they'll do it, but, you know, the more of these that they do, the more likely it is, so, yay. Uh, check it out if you get a chance to. If you don't, you're not missing anything too wild and crazy, but that's going to do us in for this edition of the Hot Tags, everybody. Thank you for watching this. As always, thank you for all your support. Make sure that you hit up the Patreon for this Mark Out moment, as well as the one for Fanboys Anonymous, too, because, in, uh, well, in a little bit, we're going to figure out exactly what the status is for Fanboys Anonymous. It's actually the 20th right now in the morning that I'm recording this Hot Tags episode. And that's when the big transition is supposed to happen for Fanboys, uh, potentially, or any other YouTube channel. So I don't know if it's going to happen in five minutes after I say this, or later on today, or if we're good. Uh, if we are not good, and we are not going to be monetized anymore then I'm going to need even more support from everybody to try to boost up that watch time and try to get us back into monetization status. And if not, then I might have to, to, to dedicate more time towards something like that and take some time out of Smart Out Moment. Um, so it helps a lot if you run the playlists in the background. Uh, just run them to boost up the watch time. You can mute them and stuff like that. And that's something just going forward that you want to help out, do that. But if we do not get monetized anymore, the biggest thing in the world that can possibly help is the Patreon account. Uh, any a buck or five bucks or 10 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever like that per month actually goes a long way towards convincing me to continue doing stuff and to try to improve in the future and to invest my time and to invest my money for that sake to try to do more things, try to try to do more fan tracks, to do more commentary tracks of movies and tv shows to do more podcasts to do more outside the box entertainment type of stuff and any suggestions you have of what we can do for fanboys anonymous and for smart cat moment for that idea in general you know i need resources to be able to pull them off so keep that in mind uh all support that you guys give to me in some fashion or another whether it's monetary or it's sharing things on social media or watching the videos, or uh, leaving your comments, you know, the things like that. Anything that you guys do is always uh, greatly appreciated. And if you want to be aware of what's coming in the future for fanboys, at the very least, we got the Oscars coming up. That's something that I want to try to do something about, even though the Oscars suck this year. And there's also Jessica Jones coming up. I just did my Black Panther review. Movie was fucking awesome, so go check that out. If you want to be aware of when the next thing is going for uh, Smack Dunk and for Smart Out Moment, then hit that subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications because that is going to be our predictions for Elimination Chamber 2018 coming up a little bit later on this week. Of course, following that is going to be following the pay-per-view itself, the post-show review recap, and then next week we are going to be doing the mailbag for uh, what month are we? February. So... Send in your mailbag questions as soon as you can so I can backlog those. And we will see you when we see you, everybody. Thanks for watching this, as always. Again, this has been another Smart Out Moment, and I'm being counted out.